Good morning. Welcome to the first Healthcare Working Group webinar. Um, my name is Peter Galley, I'm the chair of the group, and I'll be giving you a brief introduction and some housekeeping on today's session. Um, I will keep it brief and I'll allow plenty of time for the presentations and questions at the end um, of the presentations. Today's event will hopefully be the first of many as we relaunch the working group this month, and we'll give you some details about how we're going to do that at the end of the session. Next slide. Sorry, this, sorry, previous one. Oh. Um, today's topic is one that's impacted us all and the response required and impact on the NHS and healthcare has been unprecedented and forced new ways of thinking and delivering FM in the backdrop of the global pandemic. People have thought for years and have been saying for years that we are not ready for a global pandemic or epidemic and it has offered one of the greatest risks to the modern world. Most notably, Bill Gates said this in a TED talk back in 2015. In many ways, he was right, and no one could have predicted the speed and length of the pandemic has gripped the world. And let's hope we are coming through this and life will return to what we see as the new normal. It's fair to say COVID-19 has changed the way we work and deliver FM services, and actually shown how critical FM is in delivering frontline care for patients and the NHS and the wider community. I'm delighted to uh, say we're joined by two industry practitioners, Andy Thompson and Fran Beckett today, and both are going to outline how their businesses have supported their clients and reacted to the pandemic, adapted the ways they've worked um, to deliver healthcare and continue to deliver um, for their contracts and clients. And importantly, how as we emerge from the pandemic, um, how their future challenges and what their future challenges are. I'd like to give a brief introduction to our two speakers. Um, first is Andy Thompson. Andy Thompson is Managing Director at MIT, responsible for their Technical Services Division. He has a wealth of knowledge and experience in the FM and built environment and covered operations, procurement and lead, led major business sectors throughout his career. And his current role is managing all aspects of integrated services to a wide range of public and private sector. Our second presenter is Fran Beckett. Fran is the Head of Strategic I uh, Estates at IFM Bolton, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of Bolton NHS Foundation Trust. Fran has extensive experience in cl clinical and pharmaceutical services and over 20 years FM experience and expertise and has held several senior regional and national positions in both NHS and private sectors. I'd like to welcome them both and thank them both for their time and effort in presenting today. Uh, of course, this counts towards CPD, so please do make a note of the CPD number on the slide. Next slide, please. Um, finally, if you'd like to know a little bit more about the group or give us any feedback, then there are contact details for myself or Ray Goodyear. Um, if you sit down and please do forward them. Before we start, I'd like to say that the uh, presenters would like welcome questions on their topics, but we are going to leave them to the end, so you'll see the presentations first. Um, Ray will moderate the Q&As, uh, the questions as they come through, and we'll uh, pick them up at the end. So enough from me. I'll hand over to Andy Thompson will give us an insight into how Mighty's responded to the pandemic. Andy. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Andy Thompson. My background is from the technical engineering side of things, but um, I've worked in FM for 25 years plus um, across a whole range of sectors, as Peter's just, um, I just, I just said. Um, so first of all, what's changed in FM then? Um, and this is a broader FM um, kind of background from my perspective. This is not just healthcare, this is um, an FM across all sectors. Um, people have been safe from work at home and, and look to FM to make sure that they can allow them to return. So it's really important for FM to lead from the front. Um, we need to communicate very clearly in what we're doing and how to improve work environment. So it's, it's vital that the FM communicate properly, clearly um, make sure that people are fully aware of what's required from them and what changes have been made. Um, many workers have, um, sorry, I can see a um, I can signal thing there. Uh, hopefully, you can hear me clearly. Um, but many workers have adapted uh, and likely more working as they've um, as they've gone through the pandemic. Um, but we do have a two-tier system whereby lots of workers within the factories, the, the key workers, are such from healthcare and supermarkets, etc. 
that have kept the business on the road um, whilst you've got people that are working from home. Um, but both the kind of sides of things are, are really difficult. Um, I've been very difficult throughout this process. Um, the safest and most sustainable businesses are those that will really flourish as we come out of, the, of, of COVID, as we come out of the pandemic. And that's because um, many people have come much closer to nature uh, and to the environment, and they'll make decisions for themselves, especially now as we open up, and as um, there's lots of job opportunities for people uh, in all sectors. Um, technology has definitely been fast-tracked by five to 10 years. Um, this wouldn't have happened without the pandemic. Um, it's really allowed organisations to um, introduce or transform the way that they operate. Uh, I'll give you some of the examples as we go through later. Um, and I guess the final point from this slide really is we need to make FM much more visible now rather than being invisible. So night workers, etc., that used to be operating for cleaning or security are no longer really what we're expecting. OK, so what expectations have people got um, around um, the workplace then? So um, as I mentioned earlier, many people have enjoyed working from home and and in a position of a hurry to go back. Um, that said, um, we've surveyed um, as our customers need to be expected to go back to work uh, and look forward to that, I say, um, at least two to three days a week. Um, so that, that is very different to how we use um, um, as mentioned, colleagues will judge companies on, on the question, um, whether or not being really come, has come to the forefront. And colleagues also want um, an environment where they can um, work collectively um, and work in, in what would be frictionless experiences. So, really, um, academic and style um, affects amateur of FM such, where things happen and they happen consistently. Um, we need to be able to provide guides and, and clear controls for people. Um, and um, we need to make sure that as we reintroduce people to workplaces, that um, property is properly and professionally managed and that people can see what's going on, what's happening. There's high expectations for hygiene, security, and sterility. Um, people certainly expect much more now. We expect it to be visible real time. And, they, and there is an expectation, whether that be out in the social world or in, in the workplace. Next slide, please. So what type of environment do we need to create? Um, and in the light blue there, you can see employees and see com um, from a company perspective. So providing a, um, for employees, it's providing a true home from home experience. Um, this is really where um, um, we're making the proper decisions to go back into the workplace from a, a safe and social aspect, making sure people can talk and, and be able to collaborate in a normal way. Um, it's got to be flexible. It's got to enable creativity. And it's, it's got to be able to provide a high level of reassurance to them. Uh, from a company perspective, um, this, uh, the property itself is a key enabler to carry out business, um, whichever sector you're in. Um, so it's got to allow uh, colleagues or the, work, uh, the workforce to be able to concentrate on what they're good, what they're good at, and what they do best. A safe environment for the home, um, um, uh, as was in their home office, empowered with knowledge and data and processes that work. Um, flexible, um, reliable working facilities, um, that's the clear expectation from all. Um, and technology that's able to, to um, add value to the service itself. Um, you can see from, from both sides there really, um, both um, the employee and the company themselves want something very similar. So really it's, it's a joint thing that we try to find a way to um, create the right environment suitable for both. And it's important we do that. Next slide, please. Okay, the, this slide is all around how, um, how uh, colleagues want to have choice, flexibility and authority to make workplace decisions. And in the main, um, we've really pushed um, the use of technology to be able to allow this. Um, people do expect technology to be used much more now um, than ever before. If you go to a supermarket or a, a fast food um, kind of establishment now, you'll see technology right at the forefront and what they do. Um, so when you go into an office or a work premises, you'll see something very similar. 
we've got the capability to measure CO2, temperature, humidity, occupation, etc. Um, and we'll be using things like virtual receptions, temperature checking, um, meeting room bookings on apps in the same way that you've bought food or drink throughout the pandemic, one would guess. Um, we also be able to monitor occupation levels. That's used also by cleaning and security um, uh, team members to be able to really manage their resources properly and to focus on the areas where there's a big footfall or there's a big issue. Um, you should be able to raise requests on demand for cleaning or security or engineering for that matter. And there's lots of other technology out there that's used to try and to improve the air quality. So UVC is one example. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, I mentioned earlier that technology is really moving things on um, and um, we've moved away from very traditional clean mops and buckets, engineering, maintenance and security in the way that it's always traditionally been done. Lots of technology from uh, in cleaning. Um, so this is really around focusing on how you can get people there quickly in the right places um, using robotics, um, using um, GPS monitoring, etc. Both of the staff and of the locations. Um, in engineering, um, we can remotely monitor, we can manage alarms, we can change and we can digitally maintain uh, properties. Um, we can also use virtual reality now um, so that um, engineers or people on the front line can be supported um, by, by people um, sat at home or sat in an office with the right information for them. Security um, can be uh, managed through live intelligence feeds. Um, to get people in the right place and to resource in the right way. Project works, you can, you can use their modeling or, or, or 3D modeling. Um, and call centers, um, chatbots uh, are more the norm now. They used to be mainly for insurance, kind of online insurance kind of uh, organizations, but chatbots now are really common. Um, and artificial intelligence also. Um, so it, that allows us all to be able to speed things up and hopefully to be more consistent in some of the decision making by the call centers. And finally, the monthly reporting using automatic reports, but also using analytics and, and things like data lakes. Next slide, please. So what is a, um, what's a more secure and smart and sustainable kind of um, workplace look like? Um, it's a bit busy to slide this, but um, if you go to from the top down, uh, I'll deal with environment first. So, um, there's, as I mentioned earlier, there's there's a, a big focus now and a, and a lot of support now for making sure that your workplace is as environmentally friendly as possible. Um, EV charging, fleet and biodiversity are two of the areas there, but it's quite common now to have working groups and, and real big strong feedback from all employees and all stakeholders as well, um, whether that be um, from the stock market if you're, if you're a, a private organisation. Um, or whether it be from the government, uh, from a public organisation. Uh, there's lots of use of technology. Um, I've mentioned that throughout this presentation, but technology in using sensors to monitor things, uh, desk availability, um, booking things like food and drink, it's more prevalent now than ever before, and it's more commonplace and more acceptable now. And so is the um, remote reception. It's far more... Um, um, accepted now by people as they arrive into an organisation. So that's it for me. Um, hopefully um, you've, um, you've enjoyed that and you've got some information around that. I look forward to answering any questions as we go forward. Over to you, Fran. Hi, everyone. Um, obviously really pleased to be presenting today. I suppose my slides really are um, really detailing and explaining the FM response actually directly into um, the trust as part of the um, global pandemic. Um, and just giving a little bit of an overview really in terms of, of how integrated um, we've been in, in terms of our response to Bolton in particular, um, whether, whether obviously people on the call are within divisions within the trust in terms of estates or, or contracted services if the services are outsourced. So. Um, just a little bit of background really on Bolton. Um, these are the figures from 2019, 2020. Um, obviously just as the winter pressures we thought were easing, um, we were then hit with the pandemic. So 
this is all in the public domain. So, you know, this is this is free to, to Google or have, have a search for it if you wish. So during that year, there were 124,000 accident and emergency attendances. I think it's really important to stress that Bolton, whilst not one of the largest trusts um, across Greater Manchester, does have one of the busiest accident and emergency departments um, across, across that geographical patch. Um, 29,000 of those patients arrived by ambulance, uh, by an ambulance, just under 400,000 outpatient appointments, and we've got quite a large community um, presence across Bolton, just over 600,000 community contacts, and the trust employs circa 5,000 staff and IFM 600 um, employees. So the ask, what was the ask during the first wave for IFM Bolton? The main, the main ask was obviously responsiveness. So whilst during January, February, um, the clinical services were starting to gear up and plan, um, plan their response to the um, pandemic, IFM was being asked to um, obviously support all of those different clinical areas. So the main, the main area initially was obviously procurement. So um, in terms of PPE and supplying those to um, the site, procurement sits within um, IFM at Bolton and it's not just FM procurement, it's trust um, and clinical procurement also. Um, this was obviously ch a changing picture as people in the sector, you know, will be, will be well aware. So um, in terms of availability of FFP3 masks, the types of masks being used, which then obviously led on to um, fit testing not only IFM staff but also trust staff as well and that whole coordination piece around us being able to respond um, as and when required. Professional advice, um, procurement professional advice absolutely um, but also um, kind of space management, space utilisation, um, how can we adapt areas, those were the types of questions that were initially starting to be asked um, in terms of the business continuity for the trust, um, what, what could we do to ensure these areas and, and how could we respond quickly enough to um, change either admin areas into clinical space or vice versa, depending on what the, what the ask was. Collaboration, um, obviously working alongside the trust um, and all of those clinical um, teams, um, but, but also at a senior level. So um, working alongside the chief nurse, um, IPC, um, ensuring that we were included um, on every meeting that was being held in terms of the planning. The space utilisation and the moves was actually and still is a really big piece. Um, whilst we knew occupation you know, across the site, we knew what services were where, particularly in the community as well. Um, we didn't know whether these areas were being utilised effectively. Um, and that's a piece of work that we're still working alongside now. Um, we um, were challenged really heavily in terms of being able to um, move teams really quickly, um, move items off site, um, provide additional services and obviously start to scale up um, the majority of our FM um, service provision in line with um, the demand that was effectively um, coming through our a &E department. Next slide, please. The service challenges. So obviously for FM in this sector, we had to ensure that we had robust, robust business continuity plans for each element of our service. Now, the, the demand or the challenge um, on those was that we were also being asked to increase our service provision. So whereas in some sectors, they may, they may have just turned into more of a monitoring type service because actually people weren't in office areas. You know, there's a lot of remote working happening um, across other sectors. Actually, within this sector, we were being asked to scale up and scale up at pace. So that was, that was a, ch a challenge. Um, adapting to changing demand. So initially we had um, red wards, amber wards, green wards initially during the first wave. Now, um, we had to um, adapt to 
um, that demand because wards were changing, elective wards were, were being changed into acute adult wards or step down wards and vice versa. So we really had to work closely with the clinical teams in order to um, not preempt it because we couldn't preempt it, but um, respond to that request because they were often at pace. And obviously we were either going into a weekend that we knew was going to be particularly difficult um, or, you know, bank holiday weekends are, are particularly challenging. Um, supporting individual teams, individual clinical teams. So this is obviously an ongoing um, support that we are providing. We don't just link in as a contract or a contractor um, to kind of a contract manager where they may be able to relay you know, what the demands may be, what the demands are coming. We are involved in every single division, in every single clinical service, because they've all got demands which ultimately either link back to space um, or us changing our FM provision one way or another. Supporting strategy and transformation. Obviously, this continues, you know, irrespective of the global pandemic, this, this activity, you know, has got to continue about how we're developing our services. Now, in terms of some of the transformation pieces, obviously the big one was around the agile working, which was which was accelerated due to the pandemic. Now, the FM element of that was linked back to the space, right? So what space can we free up um, now that people are working more agile? You know, we've got a Victorian estate. We've not got the luxury of big open plan offices you know that we can use for multiple multi-teams you know a lot of the offices are actually in with the clinical services for that division so that became quite challenging in terms of how can we free up that space and make that more flexible the other element of the transformation was around um, virtual clinical activity so we were asked to um, work alongside those project teams to um, provide some expertise around how we can change over some of that clinical activity into a more virtual um, kind of workspace, um, which again, given the age of the estate um, was, was quite challenging, but we were um, integral really in terms of working with IT. Um, so it was a whole kind of system approach at Bolton to try and make that as successful as we, as we could so that the knock on effect to our patients wasn't, wasn't kind of catastrophic. Supporting the development of the strategic outline case. So again, this is in the public domain. We are, we are bidding or we will be bidding on a, new, on a new hospital or elements of a new hospital. This was carrying on in the background um, whilst we were working through what clinical activities would transfer potentially into that and doing all the clinical planning around that. Next slide, please. So system-wide support. I think you know we've got to acknowledge that we can't do this on our own. So this slide really talks through um, all of the collaboration um, between all different aspects of the system for Bolton. So whilst we were in a command and control um, kind of situation um, and we were reporting back into GM um, on certain elements of the clinical services, um, we work very closely with our local authority colleagues. Obviously, the CCG in terms of um, space potentially that wasn't within our current demised areas. Community health partnerships. We've got we've got a number of lift um, buildings across Bolton. Um, NHS property services. Again, there are a number of um, properties that are owned by NHS PS across um, across the sector. And um, also networking and knowledge sharing with other trusts. So there were lots of phone calls in between um, myself and other colleagues from other trusts asking for advice. You know, what were they doing around a particular issue, particularly with agile working, virtual clinics? You know, how were they, how were they? going about setting those up in terms of whether they were creating a hub, whether they creating individual rooms, you know, what, what was their approach? Um, that was really, really valuable. Um, continued support. So I think I've touched on some of this. So delivering the capital projects, 
you know, these these couldn't these couldn't stop. So the same day emergency care unit, which is now up and running, we delivered that um, at the beginning of the year. HDU and ICU refurbishments, obviously we have to link in heavily with the clinical staff around this, given the pressures, but they have been completed. Staff rest upgrades, so a really positive um, project where we are improving our staff rest facilities. COVID secure screening, obviously we were, we were asked to um, ensure that our staff are working in a safe, in a safe way, um, and we've fitted just under 500 screens across the site and the community estate. Adaptation of areas, you know, I think I've talked through that in terms of us quickly having to change the usage of some of the areas. Vaccination programme, so we were asked to set, um, to set up an on-site facility, which we did, um, and over just over 10,000 NHS and health and social care staff were double vaccinated through the unit. We're obviously in the process of um, setting that up again for the booster programme once we get more clarity from the centre. Clinical service reset, um, supporting individual teams. So once the analysis was done on the backlog for some of the clinical services, we were then asked to join um, those project groups in order to help them um, find space to spread the service across multiple geographical locations um, to try and get some of the services back up and running after the first wave. I personally have been integrated uh, within the trust strategy and transformation team, um, which is really helpful. Um, so obviously space management and utilization is a, is a huge part of that, but it also gives me an insight into um, obviously what the trust, where the trust are going in terms of their strategy uh, moving forward. So changing direction, I think over the past 18 months, FM has absolutely been recognised as an integral part of delivering the services into the trust because um, it does directly impact on staff morale, um, the working environment and also the patient journey. Um, I think there's been a greater understanding of FM and a desire to have more of a more customer centric model, which the trust are actually pushing now, which is which is really good. You know, it's not just about toilets and nuts and bolts you know which in the past may have been their attitude um this is about actually a, a customer focused customer service um centric model moving forward um and i think there's been a greater understanding um of fm's services so in relation to cleaning portering um our ebme teams i think there's been a real appreciation of what those teams actually deliver and how critical they are to to the acute site. Next slide. So this is just something that we, we put out to our teams um, earlier in the year. We've now got a dedicated comms person for IFM. Um, and really it's just about thanking the staff because obviously we're a people-centric organisation and we can't deliver any of our services without our people. Um, so yes, great teams doing great work. And that's it from me, thank you. Okay, thanks folks. Um, we've prepared a poll for you to give us your thoughts, observations, and as Peter said at the beginning of the presentation, we've all faced significant challenges and changes in our business and delivery models uh, during the pandemic, and we've suggested three areas that you can see on the poll that may be important areas for you that impact your new normal going forward. Just wonder if you can take some time, please, to select one of those. Let us have your feedback as to which one of the ones that we've put on shows that um, that's the, the most important one for you to concentrate on going forward. If we haven't uh, represented your views there, let us have your views in the chat box um, if there are other topics that are more important um, for you. Thank you. Just let that run its course, uh, then we'll get some feedback on the poll. Just as a reminder, folks, as well, if you do want to ask Andy and Fran uh, any questions, please type those as well in the Q&A box.
Great. I think that's the results coming through then. Thanks, Michelle, very much indeed for that. Looks as if we've got a tie, uh, showing improved understanding of customers' needs together with the rapid introduction of some improved uh, technology and FM protocols. Um, interesting to see that change employee benefits scoring low um, probably gives us a, a bit more thought for some of the areas that we can put on for future uh, presentations. So thanks very much indeed. And back to you, Peter. I think we've got one or two, we've got one question coming in uh, that's coming to the poll into the uh, chat, Ray. Uh, yeah. There's a question for Andy. Um, Andy, how have you found the introduction of tech innovation on a soft services cleaning with your employees? And have you found any challenges adding this tech with service users in the mental health assert? Okay. Um I'll answer it as best I can. So hopefully uh, um, this is about right. And so um, introducing tech um, from a cleaning perspective is mainly around um, trying to manage resources in the right place. So we'll use sensor technology um, where possible to look at footfall. Um, and we'll also use um, wearable devices for, for staff so that we can consult them quickly and divert them to the right kind of places. Um, so the introduction of that has been fine. There's, there's not been any, uh, what I would call pushback from staff in order to do that. Um, I, I would say though, in the high secure areas, um, 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 I'm not aware of, of us using that technology in any high secure. So if it's, um, if it's um, low secure mental health estates as such, I don't see any difference between um, between providing services anywhere um, in any kind of sector. So um, hopefully that's answered the question. If I've missed the point, um, please please shout out or, or ask me um, more specifically. And Ross, follow up with a follow-up question if uh, that's not answered your question. Um, I suppose I've got one based on the poll, really. Um, so rapid introduction of improved technical FM protocols and tasks. What would you see, Andy, the sort of the, the biggest leap forward that COVID sort of given us? The biggest leap? Um, yeah. Was uh, it forced? Um, yeah. So, so the biggest leap for us has really has been around um, technology. Um, it absolutely has been a massive leap forward from technology. And there's been quite a race amongst F FM organisations countrywide to be able to introduce um, more appropriate, faster, better technology um, and, you know so people have really uh, so organizations have really invested massively and those that have not are going to fall away um, so that, that is that is one thing but the second thing is that and Fran touched on it really um, FM is, is definitely in the spotlight now um, it, it's certainly going up the chain and it's it, a uh, director level you know boardroom level um, in what's happening how it's managed how it's controlled what can we do etc so lots of the decisions that were made fairly further down the food chain before um, are really made now at board level. Um, so it, it's it's definitely brought it um, it's brought it out there and it's really uh, it's put FM in the spotlight massively. Yeah, and, for, and for one for you, you know, on the, the improved understanding of customers, how, you know, and, we, and we touched on it in you know, the pre meetings of this. What, what's what do you see as the biggest benefit uh, in terms of COVID with your with your customers, with the clinicians, for instance? I, th I think it's probably the level of involvement. So an, an, an early involvement um, in terms of their, their planning for their clinical services. They, they also now understand, actually, I, I, need, I need somebody from IFM. Um, we need somebody from IFM in this meeting. Um, just, to, just to put a little bit of challenge in as well. And obviously, I've managed um, clinical services over at, at Bolton. Um, and I think... Kind of that relationship and that understanding of of the flow through the hospital as well um, allows us to um, work alongside them possibly in a, in a different way than we have before um, in terms of um, asking them what what are you trying to achieve first rather than them jumping to the solution. So I think we, we're helping them work through some of some of some of the challenges that they've got clinically. Um, but also putting that challenge back in as well to say, right, tell me what it is you're trying to achieve. Um, 
because actually what you're asking me to to do may not do that or it may not have much longevity um in it so yeah i think the the, com the conversations are changing you know the the conversations are definitely changing okay can i come in peace i've got a couple of questions that's that's building up and a couple that came in just prior to um the webinar uh, this one for you andy um, we've seen that there are some scarcity in materials, labour, logistics, etc. throughout the industry. Are you seeing that as quite a large impact on any of the contracts or on any of your planning so far? Um, yes, so um, um, car manufacturing in particular. So in the UK, it's a, it's a massive challenge. Um, it's uh, microchips that um, you just can't buy uh, for love and the money at the moment. So uh, we we support most of the major car manufacturers, um, Toyota, Nissan, Vauxhall, Citroen, Peugeot, BMW, Rolls-Royce, etc. All of those are struggling. Um, they've, um, I think it, all of them now have taken off their night shift. They're just working on one single shift. For a car manufacturing organisation, that's a real big change. Um, we've also seen a, a scarcity in steel. Um, so where we're delivering projects, refurbs um, on some of the, the bigger projects, we're really struggling, um, you know, and we've seen delays of two and three months uh, for steel that we have to get from in the main from Eastern Europe now. So um, they're, the, they're the major challenges we're seeing. We're not seeing anything um, uh, outside of labour shortages, I guess. So we, if we go to that, so the, the supermarkets, if you go there now at the moment, you'll see a little bit of a shortage in some more than others. Um, and we're getting challenges from, um, from our staff that have been um, um, taken away or, or um, enticed to move into the likes of Amazon, the distribution companies. They've really grown um, and if they pay more than, than most of our soft services and they, and they train very well and very quickly. Um, lots of people want to go and be delivery drivers. Um, so that, that's quite a challenge to us. Um, added to that, at the start of the pandemic, we seconded, um, you know, hundreds and even thousands of staff onto um, Nightingales and onto, um, you know, the test centres yeah. to support them, um, soft and hard services. Um, and now as, the, as they start to close down or move away, that we've got to try and find a way of migrating these staff into the right roles. So yeah. it's quite a challenge for us as we've come out on, on managing resources. Yeah. But, Thanks, Andy. That's a really good response through. We've got another question that's come through from Ross. Um, thanks, Ross. It's a question for Fran. Uh, Fran, has there been any radical changes in the design requirements of your new builds um, that's impacted on the capital programme that have come in either during or post COVID um, that you'd not thought about during the uh, uh, before the COVID outbreak? So good question, Ross. Yeah, um, thanks, Ross. Um, I, I suppose the main one for us at Bolton was our challenge around our um, side room capacity. So um, percentage wise, um, in comparison to other trusts, we had quite a low side room um, percentage. Um, and whilst um, by creating additional side wards, um, that obviously took a few beds out of the system, mainly in acute adult actually it enabled us to effectively use the bed base better um, or more effectively use the bed base because obviously we weren't closing down a bay um, for for you know whatever outbreak may have may have happened on that ward so I suppose that's the main one that we've that we've implemented yeah um, I think it, I suppose the new hospital build obviously the, those percentages of side ward cap capacity versus kind of open bays has um, obviously changed as part of that specification anyway. So that's been driven by the Department of Health in terms of in terms of how we spec or how we plan clinically plan yeah. um, um, the occupancy of, of the building. Um, yeah, I suppose I suppose that's the main that's the main things that I've seen really in terms of what what we've done on site um, was really around the creation of additional side wards. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Fran, for that. I suppose this will develop, Ross, as, as well as we go down the line, especially if we've got the social care aspects coming in and as uh, NHSE and NHSI are looking 
at the various concepts for building uh, design. But good, good question. Thanks, Ross, for that. Another question has come in uh, from Simon. Um, again, Fran, if I pass this over to you, but Andy may have a view also. Um, there have been areas, or have you have there been areas that you've seen or incurred delays um, or problems from the PFI sector? Fran, if you want to just pick that up, if there are any, uh, and then Andy, if you've got a view as well from the other side. Yeah, I mean, from, from my perspective, I mean, we, we at Bolton, we we don't we haven't we haven't really got any PFI um, PFIs operating um, in the locality in terms of NHS sites. Okay. Um, but I suppose just a general um, general thing is is resource. You know, we we were all struggling. I think at the same time with um, employees having to shield because they were high risk with um, obviously. Um, staff members needing to isolate and um, particularly early on until the testing um, kind of regimes and mechanisms were improved. Um, so, so that, that sort of de delays, I suppose, in some of the, in some of the um, kind of M&E type work that we wanted, wanted to happen in a couple yeah. of years. Um, but like I, said, I think that was a struggle for us all, you know, at the same time, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. Andy, looking at it from, a different angle are you involved in any of the pfis and have especially with the handbacks etc which i think is what simon is, is alluding to as well you seen any issues uh, no it's not my specialism if i'm honest um and um whilst mighty operate across quite a number of pfis um i've only got um second hand knowledge but um i do think it's the same issue around resources that, that would be where I would point it. During COVID, we, we had the isolation quarantine issues. Now we've got issues with staff um, moving around. You know, they're going for other jobs um, that are more lucrative. So that's the challenge for us. It's keeping our resources. Okay. Okay. I think, right, just, you know, I, I run a couple of PFIs and I think from my perspective, what I saw was actually brought the PFIs and the customers together. Mm. Collaboration was much, much better uh, because the contract, in essence, and there's some good guidance that came from central government, was put to one side. It was it was kept in place, but it was put to one side and everybody was encouraged to work together. And actually, it built better relationships and, and you know, because PFI gets a bit of a bad rap, but you know, yeah. it showed how, how well public and private sectors can work together when they've got a common goal. Yeah, yeah. Very, very useful, Peter. And again, probably... A topic area that we, we can look at for the working group uh, down the line. Um, probably got a couple of last questions that uh, have come through. Uh, same question for both Andy and Fran um, is data and technology are obviously key emerging themes in FM and may have taken a little bit of a backwater during the chaos of the pandemic. How do you see, starting with Fran, data and technology taking a better um, view of the platform or a, a better position going forward? Um, I think for, for us, um, obviously, um, we've been operating as I've been now for the past um, five years or so. Um, and I think it's highlighted um, the requirement for us to um, definitely invest um, in um, in systems that allow us to monitor and capture our activity um, much better than, than, than the current one. And I, I don't think I'm, I'm kind of speaking out of turn on that. Mm -hmm. um, but also I think linking in, so within healthcare, um, and obviously for us to, to work closer with our with our customer, we've got to understand their, their systems as well. So like their, their booking systems. Now I'm fortunate that I, that I know that anyway, because I've managed clinical services, yeah. but in order to triangulate um, kind of that data and actually come up with a, with a solution that does work, um, it's not just about the, the FM delivery data, it's also about enabling and understanding um, our client and our client's data because um, then we can put the right challenge in and, and hopefully work together to, to put the right solution in. Great, thanks, Fran. Andy, I know you, you mentioned this in your presentation as well, but so I suspect data and technology, especially knowing your company, um, are going to be high on the agenda going forward anyway. 
Yeah, so, so data, technology, all of that um, in one big wrap is massively important to us. We've invested enormously, um, as have lots of the, the competition or lots of the big providers. We have to. Uh, we can't stand still. Um, the challenge that we have as an organisation is that we operate, um, we, we provide services to nuclear establishments, to highly sensitive government organisations, the government themselves, local authorities, NHS, and, and they're just some of the examples, and, and high street banks, mm -hmm. uh, as an example, that they, they all want cyber secure kind of systems and, and operations, they expect it, they need it. Um, and they also expect um, data that's provided to them, you know, um, real time. So, um, and, th and that's probably where healthcare has, has struggled a little bit to get their systems to integrate. Um, we need really as an organization to be able to integrate into whichever system a client wants to report in. Um, we can do that on our side, but, but lots of our customers can't. Um, I mentioned earlier high secure as an example that, that you know, they, they don't allow uh, data to be transferred at the back or two. Yeah. Um, so um, hopefully in the near future, though, some of those aspects will be able to um, to be able to be able to manage it uh, as such. Um, pharmaceutical organizations, they won't allow you to integrate in. So that, um, there's lots of barriers um, and they're, they're the things that we need to find a way of breaking down. Yeah. OK. Well, that's great. So thanks, Fran. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Peter, uh, for the, the questions. I think it's opened us up as well to some future thinking um, around the presentation and the points that's come out and the points that's come out with the questions. So back to you, Peter. Okay. Thank you, Maria. Um, I'd just like to spin the slides on, Michelle, please, to the future events. Thank you. Um, and right at the beginning, um, I did mention that we were looking to relaunch the working group um, later this month. Uh, so we've got an online meeting. Um, we welcome involvement input, new membership, because um, we'd really like to look to, uh, to new members and, and, and the current group to understand how you want to shape future events, how you want the group to work um, going forward. So if you're interested, please do get involved. The date is on the slide there for you to uh, make a note of and the uh, link there to, to register. Um, I'd just like to thank, you know, obviously the two, uh, Andy and, and Fran for giving up their time and, and, and um, efforts in presenting today. I'd like to thank Ray for uh, using his big black book of contacts to, uh, to make today possible. Um, and obviously the IFM, IWFM team for uh, coordinating the, the webinar. And I'd like to thank everybody who's joined today as well. Um, we've had you know, 70 plus people um, on the call today. Hopefully it was useful. Please give us feedback of future topics. I think a few things we talked about there, you know, digital hospitals could be the next, next one we talk about when we talk about data. Um, we are looking for what people want to see in terms of content um, from the group. Um, so any ideas are, are, are welcome. Um, but yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you for getting involved um, and thank you to everybody today. Goodbye.